This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank you, and thank you to Professor Allett and Professor Clare for, for inviting me. Adam Smith, who was born in 1723 and died in 1790, was arguably the greatest social scientist of all time. There's no need to beat around the bush about it. He published two major books, each of which were path-breaking. The best known nowadays is his book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, a book that he published in 1776. That book forms the foundation of much of modern economics, but there's a lot more to it than that. It also contains major insights into what nowadays we would call political science and into history, especially the role of economic development in history, and also into subjects like the sociology of religion, about which it has some fabulous things to say. His other great book, his earlier book, a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, was in part a pioneering work of social psychology, a book that explains the social and psychological processes by which people become moral. And it's also at the same time among the great works of moral philosophy, that is to say of reflection on what it means to be moral. Adam Smith was a professor of moral philosophy who gave up that job to write a book about political economy. And after publishing that book, The Wealth of Nations, he, which he published again in 1776, he spent the, much of the rest of his life to 1790 doing two things, working for the government as a collector of taxes and writing a second revised edition of the theory of moral sentiments, a book about how people become virtuous. So today, I want to look briefly at who Adam Smith was and at some of the key historical experiences that form the backdrop of his writings about the market, especially the process that uh, historians nowadays call the consumer revolution of 18th century Britain. And then we'll explore some of the key contentions of the wealth of nations uh, about how markets worked and how they could be made to work better to provide a higher standard of living for the vast majority of the population. And we'll look at Adam Smith's contention that self-interest can be channeled into socially beneficial effects. And we'll explore his notion of how a competitive market can make goods, more and more goods, available to more and more people, lifting those people out of poverty, lifting them out of material want into greater material comfort. Because the amelioration of poverty was central to Adam Smith's moral concerns. And it is the red thread, it's the light motif that unites the various parts of the wealth of nations. The wealth of nations emerged out of Adam Smith's reflections on the very real successes of 18th century Britain in producing economic growth. That is to say, Smith doesn't begin with theory. Uh, he begins with experience, with an analysis of existing institutions, asking why they work, what prevented them from, making, from working better, and and then making recommendations for how they could be uh, uh, reformed in order to work better yet. So Smith was, by profession, a philosopher at a time when philosophy included much of what we now call social science. And that first book of his, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, first published in 1759, was, as I've indicated, as remarkable a book in its own way as the wealth of nations is. And in it, Adam Smith set out to provide a social scientific explanation of how people become moral beings. His answer is too complex for me to deal with here, but it's worth remarking upon the very first sentence of the theory of moral sentiments. Because there he says the following, and I quote, no matter how selfish we suppose man to be, there is obviously something in his nature that makes him interested in the fortune of others and makes their happiness 
necessary to him, even if he derives nothing from it other than the pleasure of seeing it." End of quote. In other words, though Smith would later write a great deal about the role of self-interest in human affairs, he regarded the attempt to explain all of human action on the basis of self-interest as patently absurd, as at odds with human experience. I'll come back to the theory of moral sentiments very briefly at the end of this lecture, but first let's turn to the wealth of nations and to its immediate historical background. One of the most important developments in 18th century European life was the increasing role of commerce in life. More and more of production was not for the sake of one's own consumption, but in order to sell to others, and in turn, to earn money with which to buy goods that were on sale in the marketplace. And The Wealth of Nations was written against the background of what we now call the consumer revolution. Most people in the Great Britain of Smith's day lived in what most of us would regard as poverty. But poverty is a relative concept. And the population of Britain almost, was almost certainly better off economically than in any other major nation of the globe, with the possible exception of the Dutch. Conditions in Britain were improving, slowly but demonstrably. The nation was becoming wealthier, not only its elite, but its laboring masses as well. For perhaps the first time in history, acquiring a basic minimum of food, of shelter, and of clothing was a near universal expectation in the Great Britain of Adam Smith's day. And the fortunes of 18th century entrepreneurs, the people who brought about this commercial and consumer revolution, their fortunes were made above all by cheaply producing goods that could appeal to a mass market. Not luxury goods, but things like pots, candlesticks, cutlery, cookery, and saucepans. Objects that had, now, that had long been reserved for the rich were increasingly coming into reach of the rest of society. And there was a kind of river of new consumer goods that flowed into people's homes. New blankets, linens, pillows, rugs, curtains, kitchenware made from pewter, and glass, and china, and brass, and copper. And this flow of new affordable goods, goods that more and more people could afford to buy, together with improvements that were going on in marketing, form what we now call the consumer revolution of 18th century Britain. So The Wealth of Nations was a book written about the market by a moral philosopher and what we would now call a public policy analyst who had turned his mind to commerce with the aim of providing policies that would promote the well-being of the great majority of the population. It's not a book written for merchants or manufacturers or investors. It doesn't offer any advice on how individuals can get rich. It's not the kind of book you find in the business section of, uh, of the airport. It does offer advice on how nations as a whole can get wealthier. And by the nation, Smith meant not the elites, but the common people. And the goal of his analysis was what Adam Smith called universal opulence. And by that, he meant a respectable standard of living for as many people as possible. A standard of living that would be possible if more and more people were able to afford to buy goods in the commercial marketplace. The rise in the standard of living had been going on in 18th century Britain, even for the working poor. But economic growth was hampered, Adam Smith thought, by existing protectionist restrictions that prevented various sorts of commerce, internal commerce and international commerce. And so much of the wealth of nations was an argument for expanding freedom of trade, both within Britain itself and into the realm of international commerce. The wealth of nations then was a work of political economy. And political economy, according to Adam Smith, had two objectives. The first was to provide plentiful subsistence to the people. That's the subject of the first four books of the wealth of nations. And their grand theme 
is the theme of how institutions can be structured to provide the cheapest and most plentiful supply of goods to consumers. The second objective of political economy, as Smith conceived it, was to provide the state with sufficient revenue to cover the cost of public services, public services that Smith thought would rise, the cost of which would increase as society became more commercial. And so the last book, Book Five of the Wealth of Nations, deals with the necessary roles of government and how government can best raise the revenue necessary in order to meet those goals, which helps explain why Smith was sub subsequently appointed as a commissioner of customs in Scotland, that is to say a tax collector for the government. So now let's look at the crux of Smith's argument in The Wealth of Nations. Smith lays out what we would nowadays call a model of the capitalist economy, that is to say a simplified abstract explanation of some aspects of reality. And his model of, of a commercial economy was based on observation and then on finding generalizations that flowed from those observations. And Smith's, Smith had a great talent for creating these models, that is, for making useful generalizations that allow us to get a conceptual handle on the messy, complex reality around us. And he also had a knack for providing examples to help us see the point of the models uh, that he was laying out. And so in a few pithy sentences at the beginning of The Wealth of Nations, Smith sets out the first element of his model. And that is self-interest or self-love. He uses them as synonyms in The Wealth of Nations. Self-interest as a motivating force in market activity. As he put it in the most quoted line of the Wealth of Nations, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages." End of quote. Now, notice that Smith is not claiming that all of human relations are based on self-love and self-interest. Remember, he says at the very beginning of the theory of moral sentiments that that's demonstrably not the case. But he thinks that what in his vocabulary he called benevolence, or what we might nowadays call altruism, was necessarily a limited phenomenon. That is to say, most people, Smith thought, are altruistic to one degree or another. They're benevolent to one degree or another. But their altruism is usually most intense towards the people that they know and that they care about. The market is about exchanges between people who, by and large, don't know one another. As we'll see, it's about exchanges between people who have often never met and who don't even know that the people on whom they depend for their everyday purchases they don't know that those people even exist. So altruism or benevolence, while a real phenomenon in many areas of life, is not a motive that we can depend on in market activity. In a very striking image early in The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith gives us an example of what he means by universal opulence. That is to say, a situation in which most people are able to acquire the useful commodities that they need through the market. And he takes the case of a woolen coat worn by a common day laborer in Britain. That is to say, a common article, a woolen coat, that was now affordable to the great mass of people, thanks to the consumer revolution. Uh, a day laborer was about as, was the lowest rung uh, on the economic ladder in 18th century Britain. Uh, in other words, he wanted, to sh he wanted to examine the workings, the institutional workings that were necessary in order for people to have certain commodities that they take for granted. Everybody in England basically took for granted that most common day laborers could have a woolen coat, something that's very important uh, in the winter in Britain as, as uh, Professor Allard can tell you. 
And Smith points out the number of people who were involved. He points out that the number of people involved in making this coat is enormous. There are hundreds of people who've worked or provided their services in order for the common day laborer to wear the coat that protects him from the cold. There's the shepherd who raises the sheep. That's where the wool starts. There's the sorter of wool. There's the people who comb the wool. There's the people who dye the wool. There's the people who spin the wool. There's the people who clean the wool. There's the people who weave the wool into cloth. There's the people who sew the cloth into a coat. And then there are many merchants and, and uh, carriers who were involved in transporting these materials around the country. Not only that, but the coat isn't just the gray color of the sheep's, of the sheep's uh, wool. It's dyed. And the dye for the cloth comes from locations from around the world. And Smith reminds us that these substances, these dyes, come to England through a long process that requires shipbuilders to build the ships, sailors to sail the ships, sailmakers to make the sails. So all of these people have contributed to making it possible for the day laborer to have his coat. People who the day laborer doesn't know, or people, people who he doesn't even suspect exist. And so no wonder the day laborer can't expect on the, can't rely on the altruism or the benevolence of all these people in order to get his coat. And yet, get a coat he does at a price that even he, on the lowest rung of the economic ladder, can afford. How is that possible? That's what Smith sets out to explain in his model of how self-interest can lead to this sort of universal opulence. And so the model begins with self-interest as the motive of human interaction in the marketplace. And the main form of that interaction, what constitutes a market really, is exchange. That is to say, you give me something that you have uh, and that I want for something that I want and that you have. That something could be our labor, or it could be the use of our land, or it could be a commodity like wool or a coat, or of course, it could be money, which can be used to pay for labor or to pay for land or to pay for any commodity. So the first part of the model is self-interest leads to market exchange. The fact that we exchange in the marketplace, Smith says, makes possible the division of labor. That is to say, instead of making everything that I need for myself, I make or do one thing in particular. I grow apples, or I work in a factory, or I give lectures to college students. I, I sell my labor, or my apples, or my lectures in the market, and I exchange the money that I get for what I've sold to buy the other things that I want. And the division of labor, Smith maintains, was the great mechanism that increased human productivity. And he illustrates this again with a very tangible example. Uh, his famous description of a pin making factory in which what we would now call an assembly line of 10 men, each specialized in a particular function, creates far more pins than if each of those pin makers had tried to make the pins on their own. So he explains, he gives you this concrete illustration. One man pulls out the wire. Another person straightens it. A third one cuts it to the right size. A fourth one creates a point at one end. Then another three men make the head of the pin. And another person joins the head of the pin to the shaft of the pin. And another person uh, colors the pin. And another puts the pin into the paper into which it will be shipped. And together, he calculates, 10 men working in this divided labor could fashion 48,000 pins a day, 48,000 pins a day. He says that working as individuals, that is, if each man tried to make, a pin, uh, tried to make the pins just on his own, conducting all those parts of the division of labor by himself, the 10 men might produce 20 each man might produce 20 pins a day at most. So 10 times 20 is 200. 
So if the men didn't have the division of labor, they'd produce 200 pins. Meanwhile, they actually were producing 48,000 pins. So the division of labor has increased human productivity by 240 times. Now, this is important. In using the, the pin factory to make his point, Smith was not touting the advantages of the factory form of production in which the entire production took place under one roof. He was, the factory was merely the form in which the division of labor was most immediately visible. That is to say, it's easy to picture. And that made it useful for explaining the much larger social process in which the division of labor was spread over many sites, as was the case of the woolen coat. Smith attributes the tremendous expansion of human productivity brought about by the division of labor to several factors. First of all, the division of labor leads to specialization. That is to say, each worker who does a specialized task becomes more and more skilled at that task. He becomes better and better at it. Secondly, it saves time. If the worker doesn't have to go from pulling out the wire to cutting it to uh, making the head of the pin and so on, that saves a lot of time because he's not switching from task to task. And lastly, Smith said, it increases human productivity because uh, it, it makes it more likely that there'll be inventions produced that will cut down on the amount of labor or capital required in order to produce the pins. So now we see self-interest leads to market exchange. That exchange makes possible the division of labor. And the division of labor makes possible tremendous growth in human productivity. That makes it possible eventually for more things to be produced more cheaply. And Smith argued the wider the market, that is the more people that are involved in these processes of exchange, the more effective the greater productivity of the division of labor would be. The greater the division of labor and so the greater the productivity. But even if the market produced more and more goods through this process of greater productivity through the division of labor, the question arose, how could the market provide goods at prices that more and more people could afford to purchase? That is to say, how could it create not just opulence, but universal opulence? That is, goods that more and more people are actually in a position to buy because they're cheaper and cheaper. And here he lays out a second model that explained the conditions under which goods would be sold at their lowest possible price. He reasoned that for each commodity, for anything sold in the marketplace, uh, at any given time, there was what he called the natural price. The natural price is important, it's important to know, is the lowest price at which that good could continue to be produced. And the, any reason that a commodity, uh, that that natural price, uh, the price at which the good sold, had to reflect the average cost of labor, the average profits to be gained by investing money, and the average rent paid to landlords for the use of their land. So this natural price was the lowest price at which the commodity could be produced without laborers, entrepreneurs, or landlords losing money. The natural price then, and this is what's important to remember, the natural price is the price most beneficial to consumers. And as Smith points out, in a commercial society, all men and women were consumers, whatever else they might be. That didn't exhaust their roles, but that's one thing that everybody has in common. Consumers want goods to be available as cheaply as possible so they can afford the goods that are being produced. So there you have the natural, pro there you have the natural price. Then Smith in introduces the notion of the market price. This is a familiar notion, has to do with the relationship between supply and effectual demand. The market price of a commodity was determined by the relationship between the quantity of goods that were supplied by producers and the amount that that commodity was demanded, was wanted by those people who were willing and able to pay for it. By the way, that's the difference between uh, effectual demand and demand. Uh, you and I might both want a Porsche, but uh, unless 
but perhaps you're in a position to have the $50,000 to pay for it, and so your demand is effectual demand. That is, I may like it, I might like the idea of having it, but I don't effectively demand it because I don't have the means available to pay for it. So the market price, then, is determined by the relationship between supply and demand. And now is we see the brilliance of Smith's model. He explains why the market price of commodities would tend towards their natural price. That is to say, the lowest price at which they can continue to be sold and the price that's best for consumers. He also explained how the supply of goods would tend towards the level of demand and how the level of demand would make its way uh, in the direction of the supply of goods and how all of this would take place without anyone in a position of authority deciding on the amount of those goods that should be produced or the price at which they could be produced. And here's his logic. He says at any given, pri at any given time, if the market price of a good rises above or below the natural price, then people will respond. If the market price goes below the natural price, those who produce that commodity will be motivated by self-interest to produce some other commodity where they could make a larger profit. And that would lead to a decreased supply of the original commodity, and then the market price would rise again. If the market price of a commodity went above the natural price, those people with capital or labor would say, oh, I can make more profit, or I can make higher wages if I move my resources into producing that commodity. And so they would move their labor, or they would move their land, or they would move their money into producing that commodity. And then the supply of it would go up, and when the supply goes up, and the demand remains the same, the price goes down. And so, uh, and so the moral of Smith's analysis was that when the market was structured to operate along the lines of this model, the market price would tend to provide more and more goods at the cheapest price at which they could be produced. And in that sense, the market would provide the greatest possible benefit to consumers. So the market, the, the competitive market, was the most efficient institutional mechanism by which to channel self-interest into the wealth of the nation, and especially to promote the well-being of the bulk of the citizens by providing them with more goods at prices that more and more people could afford. Now you'll notice that none of those involved in the production of these commodities were primarily motivated to provide their services by a concern for the welfare of the consumer. Not the laborers who provided their labor, not the landlords who leased their land, and not the entrepreneurs who invested their capital. They each pursued their own self-interest. But by pursuing their self-interest through the market, they ended up benefiting the consumer. And Smith, as a social scientist, could explain the logic that transformed this quest for self-interest into universal opulence. And once the logic of the market mechanism was understood, it could be more easily put into place by policymakers, who are now in a position to anticipate the positive social effects of the market mechanism. And that brings us to Smith's famous image of the invisible hand. He's explained how, under the right institutional conditions, and we'll come back to that in a moment, individuals pursuing their self-interest through the competitive market are compelled into actions that ultimately have beneficial social effects. Without intending to promote the self-interest, uh, without intending to promote the public interest, they end up doing so. And they're compelled to do so by the structure of incentives created by the market. So in his famous metaphor, Smith writes that though the individual, quote, intends only his own gain, he is led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention, end of quote. And this image 
of the invisible hand has nothing, you have to understand, there's nothing mysterious about the invisible hand. It's a metaphor for the socially positive, unintended consequences of the institution of the market, which through increasing productivity and declining prices channels the self-interest of individuals into collective benefits. So there's nothing mysterious about the invisible hand, at least once its functions have been explained by Adam Smith's social scientific explanation. And yet, because there's a gap between the explicit intentions of the actors in the market and the ultimate results of their action, the notion that the social outcome of market processes is socially beneficial is counterintuitive. The consumer knows from his experience that the merchant sells him a commodity for more than the merchant paid for it. Right? Not only that, but after having tried to purchase it as cheaply as possible, the merchant tries to sell that commodity for the most that he can get. That's self-interest. And so most consumers were at a loss to explain how they benefit from a system made up of many such merchants. But Smith does explain it. And that's why the wealth of nations remains the starting point for understanding a capitalist economy. And it's why some version of Smith's analysis is now found in every economics, economics textbooks. Now, you'll notice that this whole notion that self-interest can lead to socially beneficial outcomes makes moralists very uncomfortable. It makes preachers very uncomfortable because what do moralists and preachers emphasize? They emphasize intention, right? And they don't often, they don't often su suppose that it's possible that good intentions in the sense of benevolent or altruistic intentions can have negative outcomes and that self-interested intentions can have socially positive outcomes. So this, the whole market mechanism, as Smith explains it, uh, is still very uncomfortable for people with a certain kind of moralistic mentality to, um, to really take in. Now, as I say, some, some of this explanation appears in every economics textbook, but what those textbooks tend to leave out is Smith's explanation of why real life so often diverges from his model of the relationship between self-interest and socially beneficial outcomes. Some people are so struck by Adam Smith's demonstration of the potential, of the potential beneficial effects of self-interest that they think that self-interest always leads to beneficial outcomes. They, and they mistakenly believe that Smith asserted that everything would work out for the best if people merely followed their self-interest. But in fact, Smith's analysis in The Wealth of Nations is far more subtle than that. Again, remember the model. From the point of view of the public interest, the public interest understood as this universal benevolence of more and more people having access to more and more of the, of the essential and luxurious uh, commodities that are available in the market. From the point of view of the public interest, it was most beneficial for every person to pursue their self-interest by channeling it through the competitive market. But from the point of view of an individual producer or from the point of view of a group of producers, in terms of their self-interest, it was most beneficial if they could circumvent the competitive market, if they could get around the competitive market, if they could produce their goods in a non-competitive market. The market would produce the best possible outcomes for consumers, Smith said, under conditions of what he called free competition. That is to say, relatively free sale of land, uh, easy entry of merchants into existing markets, and few restrictions on the hiring of labor. But as he showed in The Wealth of Nations, much of European society and government was structured to actually prevent this kind of free competition. And that was no accident, Smith thought, because it was in the self-interest of individuals and groups of producers to get around the competitive market in a way that was at odds with the public interest. They wanted to limit competition so they could work less or make higher profits 
or get higher rents or get higher wages. And Smith thought that the proper task of the legislator concerned with the public interest was to prevent this short-circuiting of the market mechanism, despite organized economic interests that sought to protect themselves from economic competition. And in The Wealth of Nations, Smith showed that whenever and wherever individuals or groups could promote their self-interest at the expense of the public interest by bypassing the free market, they would do so. He shows that the citizens of the towns contrive to keep up the price of urban-made goods at the expense of the inhabitants of the countryside. He shows that the legal privileges of guilds res restricted the supply of labor into various occupations, and that kept wages above the market price. Uh, and it also kept, uh, this, and these guilds also restricted the supply of commodities, and that kept profits above the natural price. As for merchants, Adam Smith writes, quote, people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices, end of quote. And the most effective means of circumventing the competitive market was through legal monopolies that gave an individual or a particular company or a particular guild the sole right to sell a particular product. For Smith, most of the existing laws having to do with foreign commerce were motivated by one or another group of merchants and manufacturers trying to limit competition for their goods. And he explains in The Wealth of Nations that they're particularly well, they were particularly well placed at the time to do so. They were located in big cities, especially the capital, London. They had money with which to influence politicians the equivalent of PACs nowadays. They also had articulate spokesmen who presented the interest of their particular group of merchants as, as if it were the public interest, the equivalent of ideological think tanks nowadays. They hired writers or wrote books themselves to explain why it was that it was in the national interest to prevent competition in their particular branch of commerce. So Smith showed that the pursuit of self-interest does not automatically or inevitably lead to public benefits. The question is, how can one keep individuals and groups from trying to use their political influence to benefit themselves at the expense of the public interest? And how can one prevent politicians from taking the path of least resistance and doing whatever their supporters from one or another organized lobby ask them to do? Uh, if those if all of those lobbies are successful, it means the diminution of competition. It means slowing down the progress of and the social dynamism of the capitalist system. So what was Smith's answer to this? Actually, he has no single knockdown answer. But one purpose of the wealth of nations was to warn politicians and policymakers of the dangers that protective legislation and other ways of getting around the market posed to the development of the well-being of most of the population. So Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations in order to counter what he called the sophistry and clamor of individuals and groups urging legislation that protected them from market competition. And that remains a problem from his day to ours. And again, it's not, the problem isn't uh, the suppression of self-interest. Self-interest, if it doesn't go through the proper institutional channels, that is, the channel of the competitive market, doesn't lead to public benefits. Right? And that's what the wealth of nations is about. So there's an ongoing tension, Adam Smith would say, in capitalist societies between the public interest in a better standard of living through the availability of more and more goods at cheaper prices, and that requires a competitive market. And there's a tension between that and particular interests of individuals and groups in society who try to get government to protect their interests by eliminating competition. Self-interest, then, is the great engine of economic growth and the good things that economic growth can bring, but only if properly channeled. And that brings us back to the purposes of the wealth of nations, which was in part to encourage a certain level of 
non-self-interested virtue in politicians and in citizens. And that brings us back to the theory of moral sentiments in which Smith describes a kind of ladder of morality that begins with the self-interested search for the approval of others at the beginning, but at its highest level, at the level of the genuinely, uh, 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 at the, the most noble kind of morality, it represents a quest for our own self-love, the self-love of the person who knows that he's actually acting wisely and virtuously, and who's concerned with discovering the means for improving the lot of his fellow men and women. So Smith definitely belongs on that highest rung, which is why he was so interested in the uses, abuses, and limits of self-interest, and why you should be as well. Thank you. Yes. I guess I did not know before how much um, Adam Smith had invested in the, how uh, self-service provides for others. So what exactly did uh, R.M. Keynes develop uh, from Adam Smith and this um, self-service uh, assisting others? So what, what is the difference between their systems? Between Smith and Keynes? Uh, well, Smith also, uh, sorry, Keynes, who was a famous economist from the 1920s through his, his death in 1944, Keynes also believed that the capitalist system was based upon self-interest. Uh, and he also believed that the capitalist system was tremendously productive. In fact, in a famous lecture uh, on an address to our grandchildren, uh, he talks about the fact that uh, in four or five generations, uh, the capitalism would increase its productivity by something like 8%, uh, sorry, by eight times. And uh, he thought the problem of poverty would essentially be solved. Well, he turned out to be right in his prediction. In many ways, the capitalist system is eight times more productive than when he gave that talk. Uh, uh, so his differences with Smith were not about the role of self-interest uh, and not about the, the notion that the role of the economist as an advisor to uh, policymakers was to try to promote uh, universal opulence. The, uh, his differ uh, Keynes' differences were more with uh, particular concepts and doctrines at the time about how the market actually functioned and to what extent uh, he was writing in, in the Depression, remember. Well, first he was writing, well, Britain before the Depression, but with very high levels of unemployment in Britain in the 1920s. And then he was writing in the Depression itself. And there he disagreed with many existing economists and, and policymakers about uh, how quickly self-interest would express itself in changes in investment. And he has a kind of psychological explanation uh, about why under certain economic circumstances people who have money will tend not to invest it even when it actually might be in their self-interest to do so. So in that sense, he. It was a mechanical question about the limits of self-interest under particular um, economic circumstances. But the differences between them are not fundamental. Yes? So um, Smith talks about the specialization of labor within a nation as a good thing because it contributes to the wealth of that nation. So I'm wondering if... Uh, sorry, and then, and then the, he extrapolates from that yes. that the more that the larger the market, the more specialization there'll be, and hence the greater degree of overall productivity there'll be, and that's the fundament of the argument for international free trade. Yeah, so what I'm wondering is, in today's um, economic system with globalization, if you think that under Smith's economic philosophy that outsourcing to other countries mm -hmm. would be a positive thing because it's increased, um, increased, sorry, uh, it's easier to produce goods at a cheaper level or if that's a bad thing because it's taking the wealth outside of the nation to produce goods. Okay, so that's a very good question and a lot of the wealth of nations was an attack on the notion that international economic relations are a zero-sum game. That is the notion that, and this is what most people believed at the time, that if one nation was getting richer, another one must be getting poorer. 
be because it's a zero-sum game, right? So for every gain, there has to be a loss. So Smith criticizes that notion, pointing out that two nations, or 20 nations, trading with one another can all be better off through this greater division of labor. Right? Now, Smith was not uh, Smith was great at creating these models, but he wasn't an ideologue. That is to say, he, he actually has a brilliant critique of people who um, think that they can take a model and just apply it directly to reality all the time without considering the particular empirical circumstances of the time. And uh, although he uh, laid out this, this model, and although a lot of it still holds true, that is, my guess is that many of the things that you're wearing and carrying on your person, from your sweatshirt or sweater to a cell phone or whatever, are <coughs> made possible by the tremendous international division of labor, which makes it possible for you to afford those things, and which incidentally raises the standard of living of the people producing them in Bangladesh or China or India or wherever they're being produced, um, there's still the fact that some people in uh, a richer society might turn out to be worse off uh, if their jobs can be done and are done more cheaply abroad. So it might help society as a whole, but it might hurt particular parts of society. And Smith has a discussion about how uh, when you change economic regulations, uh, you should try to compensate people in part for the changes that are brought about uh, in order to make it more palatable for them. So there's lots of things that could be said about the subject, but the, the Smithian approach would be to take the general model and then see what the particulars of the case are. But you'll notice that the general model does help explain one of the most important things that's been going on in the world in the last 30 years, and this will surprise you, and that's a greater degree of equality internationally, uh, not least because, because the two countries with the largest population in the world, namely China and India, have substantial parts of their population that have gotten a lot richer in the last generation. So the, the gap between those societies and the wealthy societies of Europe, the United States, and Japan has diminished even though, for a variety of reasons that we can go into over dinner if you're interested, uh, equality within those advanced, sorry, inequality has increased within those advanced industrial nations. Yes? Um, so Smith seems uh, largely concerned with um, benefiting the majority of people yep. or the largest number of people. Yes. And I think if that's your goal in the free market, that's a very good job. But I think that uh, some political theorists, in particular, in particular Rawls, would say that if we're interested in eradicating poverty, mm -hmm. that I really we should focus on uh, the greatest advantage for those that are currently the least advantaged in society, not necessarily the majority of people. And uh, would be likely to say that Smith's approach um, would promote a type of utilitarian calculus where some people could be uh, greatly disadvantaged if it. Uh, you know, supported uh, kind of middle class, you know, to get uh, commodities as cheaply as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, to give a specific example, um, in 1842, the Ashley Mines Commission in England uh, reported that uh, the workers in uh, coal mines were being, uh, their conditions were really unconscionable. Mm -hmm. um, although, you know, the free market was allowing that, and it was uh, greatly decreasing the price of coal and the price of uh, transporting goods mm -hmm. throughout England. Um, but so it was uh, good for the majority, but bad for the uh, least advantaged minority. Uh, what do you think would be Smith's solution to such a problem? Well, first of all, I'm not really sure that there is such a big difference between Smith and Rawls, because Rawls does have lots of room in his political philosophy for inequality, as long as it uh, tends to raise uh, the quality of life of what Smith in The Wealth of Nations is calling that common day laborer. So he's actually implicitly using a, if I can be anachronistic, uh, using a Rawlsian criterion. Right? So I don't think there's a fundamental 
uh, there's a fundamental tension there. Now, uh, it's true that uh, you know the conditions in mines in Britain were pretty terrible. In some mines, were pretty terrible in the 1840s. To which there are two things that need to be said. You have to ask yourself if that if that's so. Why did people work in those mines? That is to say, you always have to ask yourself what alternative did they have? After all, there weren't they weren't slaves. Uh, they weren't indentured servants, they weren't serfs, though all of those forms of labor existed elsewhere in the world in 1842. So why is it that people were working in those mines? Presumably, they believed it was in their self-interest to do so. Secondly, you have to understand, Adam Smith was not the kind of guy who would wear an Adam Smith tie. That is to say, he's, he's on the one hand, uh, an empirical, he's an empirical social scientist, a moral philosopher concerned with trying to explore internet in institutional mechanisms, explaining how they work in order to make them work better, work better under the conditions of the time. At the time, there was a barely developed bureaucracy in Britain in terms of governmental bureaucracy. So there was, there was no agency that was available to inspect mines at the time. That doesn't mean that Smith would have been antipathetic to the idea of having government mine inspectors with regulations that one then had to live up to. You see? Yes, at the back, sir. What did Smith think of the role of the family in all this? Uh, uh, Smith, Smith, in The Wealth of Nations, uh, Smith has relatively little to say about the family except in one very important respect. Remember, he's living at, the t at a time just before the Industrial Revolution, or at sort of at the very cusp of the Industrial Revolution. But he's living at a time of this commercial revolution, and this consumer revolution, in which you have the spread of a factory system in which more and more labor goes on under this division of labor. And, that, and, and new mechanical means of, lab, of doing work were increasingly coming into use. Near the beginning of The Wealth of Nations, he talks about the fire engine, which is what we mean by, which is the term at the time for what we now call a steam engine. And he points out that uh, labor is developing in such a way that uh, it's more and more possible for children to work in factories. And they're being drawn into factories because the parents and perhaps the children, but the parents at least are pursuing their self-interest. They're sending the children into factory work. <laughs> and Smith thinks that actually this is a, a bad thing in terms of overall moral and intellectual <coughs> development. And so he ac actually recommends a number of uh, means and regulations for trying to limit child labor and creating all sorts of incentives for children to go to school. First of all, the provision of, uh, the provision of cheap education for more and more children, something which, which didn't exist in Britain at the time was something that he encouraged. And then he has a number of other measures to try to uh, encourage people to make sure that their children and they themselves get education. So he talks about the family in that sense. Um, uh, and then in the theory of moral sentiments, he has some, even though he himself was a, was a bachelor, uh, he has some very, a few very acute observations about the way in which having a child in the household observing the parents tends to lead to an improvement in the parent's own moral behavior, which is very insightful, especially, as I say, for someone who didn't have children himself. But on the whole, uh, it's not a topic that he addresses at length. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.